see, we got, what is that? Here? This is sweet. I like this. Every time we have kids up here, it seems like we got young men, and I love this. Um, so I have a couple of questions for you, just some real simple, simple questions. Are you ready for it? Okay. Okay. Do you know what your name is? Okay. Tell, tell me what your name is. So Simon, King and Patrick, I have one question for you. Just one question. And then I'm going to explain something to you. Really, really okay. Any question I have, just one question. Are you ready for this one question? Okay. Do you love Jesus and is he in your life and in your heart? To say yes or no. Yes. So we have three boys up here that they acknowledge that Jesus is in their heart. Acknowledge it. Okay. So if Jesus is in your heart, what did he do for you? Last question, sorry. Did he die for your sins? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, he wipes all your sins away, right? So you acknowledge Jesus, meaning acknowledge means that, yeah, I agree with that. That's what the word acknowledge basically means. I agree with that. Yeah, I agree with that. So do you agree? show you something, and then this is what we're going to do, okay? I'm going to show you two things. Does anybody know what this is? Okay, bread. Christian bread. Okay. I guess there's secular bread, too. <laughs> this is, and you're right, it is bread, but do you know what it's symbolic of? Do you know what it represents? Repres okay, it represents Jesus. Good, good, good. Jesus' skin, okay, all right, that's good. His body, right, okay. And, and so, Simon, this is this is represents Jesus' body, right? Yeah, Patrick, it represents Jesus' body. Now, is this Jesus' body, or does it just it represent? Okay, it just represents it. He's got the idea. That's good. Because I'm sanitary, I'm not going to... Does anybody know what this is? It's juice. You're exactly right. It's juice. Now, grape juice, it represents God's blood. That's right. And what does his blood do? Stays in his body. Blesses us. Okay, how does it, his blood bless us? It is powerful. You're exactly right, Patrick. It is powerful. You don't care about it. It is, it is powerful. You're exactly right. So his blood brings us peace. You're exactly right. It brings the power. There's power in his blood. What else? What else is about his blood? His blood does what? Tell me something else. Man. What else does his blood do? That's something to do with sin. Moves our sins, yes, this, yes, exactly. Now let me ask you this question: Is this juice? Is this real blood? No. Look, it's juice. It just does what? It represents his blood, right? So it just represents his blood. Okay. So what we've established this morning is this: We established three things. You know what the word establish means? No. <laughs> let me explain. Let me explain. Okay, I'll make it simple. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. All right. That's good. Okay. All right. We got it. All right. All right. All right. We got it. So this is this is what I want you to do, parents. If you have a child up here, I want you to come up here with your child, or if you or if it's your grandchild, whichever. This is what we're going to do this morning. Have y'all have y'all ever taken communion before? No. Okay. No. All right. Well, this is what we're going to do. Your moms, your mom, your dads, your grandparents. Yeah. Whatever. 
<laughs> they, they've taken communion before, and they understand what it is. They do this every Sunday. But what we're, what, what we're going to do today is we're going to do something a little bit different. Because this is our communion message, and our children's going to all tied into one. What we're going to do is, is we are going to have the parents serve you communion. What do you think of that? Yeah, me? All right. So what we're, and I'm going to show you, I'm going to tell you how this is going to work. Okay? Let me, let me tell you how this is going to work. They're going to, they're going to grab a cup and a bread for themselves. Okay? And then they're going to give you a cup and a bread. And then you hold on to it. And then our, then our deacons and our elders will give the juice and the bread out to everybody else that is here as well. Okay? Because we always take the juice together. Does that make sense? Okay? And that way your parents are serving you communion. And you're taking it together as a family, as an example. Amen? So let's, let's go into prayer. And then, uh, then we're going to do this. Father, I thank you for your love. I thank you this morning for your blood that washes and cleanses us from all sin. I thank you for the bread, Lord, which represents your body that was broken for you. And so, Jesus, we thank you today that our sins are forgiven. We thank you today, God, for your strength and your wisdom. We thank you today, Lord, that today we are cleansed. We are set free. Lord, we've asked Jesus in our hearts. And, Lord, each one of these boys up here even today said, yes, Jesus in my heart. Father, there's not an age that I can There's just a, a remembrance of you. It's, a, it's an act of remembering what you've done for us on the cross. And so, Lord, this morning, that's exactly what we're doing as families, as we gather here as one church family. And Lord, as even today, as we're represented up here as, as, as families, and Lord, as they take communion together and they serve one another. So, Father, I just thank you this morning, Lord, as we go into our, our meditation song here. God, that, that we distribute our ornaments. Lord, that we're just remem reminded of who you are. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name.
Father, I just thank you for the gift that you've given to me. Lord, I ask that you continue to prosper in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. God is an amazing God, isn't he? He is powerful, that is for sure. We've been talking about out of Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 1, we've been talking about these different seven nations. We started out with Baal, uh, talking about what Baal was. We kind of went into a four-week thing with that and overcoming uh, Baal worship and what that looks like. And, and we're now into these seven different nations. And last week we talked about the Hittite nation and the fact that the Hittite nation, one of the things about the Hittite nation is the Hittite nation does everything it possibly can to create a Anxiety, depression, anything that's going to pull us down or to get us distracted from faith. Because the Bible says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so the Hittite spirit is exactly what they, what it wants to do. And when you look at when you look at the name Hittite, it actually means terror or it means fear. And so so God knew exactly what He was doing when He told Israel that go in and you have to destroy these areas of uh, destroy these nations. But when we get into the New Testament, we know that our warfare is not carnal, but it's mighty through God. We're pulling down our strongholds. It's also for taking every captive, making it obedient, or thought, making every thought, making it obedient to Christ. But it's also um, the fact that we don't war anymore physically, we war in the Spirit. And because we have the power of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us to be able to destroy the works of the enemy. Well, this morning, I, I want to go into the Gergeshite spirit, and this is a, actually probably a familiar spirit in a way um, to many of us. Um, Hittite spirit is probably familiar, I'm sure, to many of us as well, because I'm sure every one of us has dealt with fear in our life. But today, we're going to be talking about the Gergeshite spirit in uh, cleaning up the strongholds. And uh, we got we got uh, five more after this, and I'm uh, looking forward to getting through these, because I believe that if you take these, really apply it to your life, it can really reveal where we are, or maybe where we need to be in God, um, because when you take it to the New Testament, it's obvious, uh, God tells us in these areas we need to overcome, um, but let's open in prayer this morning, Father, I thank you this morning for your word, I ask that it goes forth in power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit, Father, I ask that you would invade Lord, I ask that every distraction be gone. I ask that every attitude be gone. I ask that every thought that's not of you be gone. Lord, I ask anything in here that is not of you that is would hinder from receiving the word that we planted upon this soul be gone. Lord, I ask that you would invade our space in such a way that we could come out of here this morning. That we could come out and say, get our hearts not. Back in 1994 through 96, I had the opportunity, I'm sorry, 1993 to 95, I guess dates right now, I'm being old with these dates and experience, blurry it seems like. But between 93 and 95, I was living in uh, Waxahachie, Texas, and I had met some, uh, some good friends down there, and I met a pastor named Gerald Wait, and uh, he had pastored the same church for a long time, and, and when I met him, he was actually renting the church building out at the time, but they had, the, the church they were in was an older church and this sort of thing, and, and uh, they had sold their building, and like I said, when I got to meet him at this, at this particular time, they were already meeting on Sunday afternoon, they had rented the building um, from another church, but what it, what it ended up happening is I sat down and I asked Gerald, I was like, what is going on here, why are you meeting on Sunday afternoon, why are you meeting on Thursday evening, you know, typical church, typical, what's typical, right? typical church meets on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, but you're on Thursday afternoon, right in the middle of everybody's mess that they've got going on, and plus you've got not only that, but you've got a Thursday night instead of a Wednesday, what is going on, and this is what he told me, he said, you know, he said, we were in a building that used to be debt free, 
And he said, we, we were in that building and, and we were praying and believing God as to what we needed to do. And he says, as I was in prayer, God began to speak to me about moving. And he said, you know, I did not want to move. He said, I just flat out did not. And he said, I argued with God for three months before I even entertained him. And he said, I, I argued with God about it because we were in a debt-free building. We owned everything we had and all that. And he said, so I took it to the board. And as I took it to the board and the elders of the church, the board and the elders of the church were like, you know, we believe, believe, believe in you, believe God is leading you. Whatever God wants to do, let's do it. So they took it to the congregation. Well, when they took it to the congregation, there was only about 60% of the people that were behind it. And, and you know that's almost like a church split in a way. And, and so they went ahead and they decided to sell the building and, and begin to rent out on a Sunday afternoon, on Thursday evenings, this building that they were in. And I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, okay, well, why in the world would you want to split the church like that? You know, I've got all these question marks as a young minister continue to tell his story. He said, you know, he said, we're, we're about 35, 40 people now in the congregation that we have. And he said, we're on a Sunday afternoon, we're on Thursday evening. He goes, the one thing that we have continuously done is we continuously tithe to missions every single day. He said, we don't just tithe to missions, but we also go on mission trips. Because we believe that as we sow into souls through this season that God has us in, that we are going to reap a mighty harvest because this word tells us what that harvest looks like, we're not sure, but we're praying and believing it's going to be sold. We're praying and believing it's going to be souls that, for the kingdom of God. Well, that was that was in 93, 94. In 95, they went to go buy some land, and they found this land on 287 and I-20. In 287 and I-20, anybody who's been down in Arlington, they know that little area right there, patch of land, sits up on a hill. And this is the land that they got. The land that they got right here, now granted, this used to be all farmland, it isn't anymore. But where this sits right here is 10 acres. And this is prime real estate worth a lot of money, 10 acres. Um, when I was there in 95, the first building right there, the first big white square was the only building, and that was the building um, that we were working on at the time. Well, when they went to purchase this land, you know, they, 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 here's the crazy thing about it is the district was against the pastor. Half the congregation was against the pastor. The community thought he lost his mind. But when they went to go purchase this land, they went to take the $100,000 that they were able to save within four years. They went to put that money down as a, as a, not a deposit, you know, uh, anyhow, toward the property. And as they put the, went to put the $100,000 down toward the property, the owner of the property ripped up the check and said, I cannot sell it to you. My parents made, forced me to make the decision that if someone came in here and wanted to build a church on this property, I was to give them all 10 years. Yeah. So he gives, he gives, so he gets the 10 acres. Now, granted, all this back in here used to be nothing but trees and stuff. So they went and they, they, they got they got the 10 acres. Well, then they're like, okay, well, we still have a building we have to do. We got sewers we got to run. We've got all this other stuff we've got to run. All we have is this $100,000 that we've saved. That's all we've had. Well, word gets out in Arlington and all in Dallas and Fort Worth what is going on. Next thing you know, he ends up with a million and a half dollar building built. And all it cost him was the $100,000 that they saved. You say, why, why am I telling you this story? Well, today, you have, you have that church building there, but they also have a daycare. They also have a K-12 school. And they have a church that's well over 300 people. From 35 to well over 300 people. You say, why are you telling me that? Because they continue to sow and they continue to reap. They continue to sow in their season when there seems like there was nothing more. When the season seemed to be dry, when the season seemed to be bleak, they continued to sow when they feel like Abraham walking out and not really knowing where they were going. They continue to trust and believe God even when those that you trusted, even those that you looked up to, even those that you respected their opinions on were against you. They still stepped out. The 
question is, is what have they not stepped out? What if they did not step out in faith? What if they did not step out and believe and trust God for what was unseen? What if they did not step out and trust God for what could have been or what could be? Well, they would have missed the blessings of God. They would have missed what God had for them at that time. You know, what if, what if Pastor Wade, just think about this, what if he listened to logic instead of obeying the word of God? What if, what if their sights were locked on the vision, what they have instead of dreaming of what the Lord wanted to do? What if for a minute they listened to the naysayers telling them to stop, you're crazy, you're out of bounds, instead of believing God for the impossible? And instead of allowing to be, them to become discouraged, they began to do what David did, get in the Word and encourage themselves in the Word. They would have missed a major blessing of God. I tell you that story because, see, the enemy wants to rob us of the promises of God very easily. By getting us so focused on the visual, so focused on the logical, instead of having faith and hope in the Lord. The enemy wants to become so wants us to become so overwhelmed with earthly pressures and earthly things in our life that we ignore or we forget or we reject the divine providence that God can have in our life if we would just trust Him. If we would just step out enough and say, it doesn't make sense, but okay, God, if that's what you say, if that's where you're leading, if that's what you're wanting, what would happen if we took God at his word. What would happen if for one moment we stepped out in faith and said, okay, God, even if it doesn't make sense, I believe we would see things that we may have never seen before happen. See, one of the seven nations Israel received instructions from the Lord to destroy, received its name by, and they received their name. This is the name of the, the meaning of their name. Basically, it means they were focusing upon sensuality and visual logic that was based upon temporal things. This nation was known as a coarse on people, spreading contention. They spread discord. They spread strife. They like to stir up trouble. They like to always be the agitator instead of be the agreeer or to come in peace or to cre create union with somebody. They, these were a people that were discord, strife, trouble. This nation did everything it could to get people so focused on the temper and the pressures of life around them so that they would lose their own identity and miss the promises and blessings of God in their own life. This nation is called the Gershite nation. It's also known as the Guardians of the New Testament. The name means to drag away or cause strife or contention or to oppose or to quarrel. And it refers to clay dwellers. When you think clay dwellers, why clay dwellers? I'll tell you here in a minute. Because clay dwellers go a little bit deeper in symbolism and what it symbolically means is to have a clot. You ever had a clot of dirt you just can't seem to break up? And, and probably more men in here, maybe some of you women in here, you know, you're digging a hole and you hit that clot of dirt. It's like, man, you're like punching it, you're taking a hole and you're trying to hit it. You just get a shovel out and trying to break it up. And what is that clot from? That clot is from the hardness of the soil, from not receiving moisture around it, from not receiving the life it needs. Basically, what is a clot? It is trouble. What is a clot? It's something you gag on, you want to throw out and get away. You know, I mean, when I think of a clot of dirt, and this might sound kind of gross, but when I think of a clot of dirt, I think of a cat with a hairball in its throat. It's just one of those agitating, aggravating things that eventually you just have to find out. Why? Because it don't belong there. Why? Because it's difficult. It's, it's ridiculous having it. But these clay dwellers, this hard, this hard clod, it represent, re represents earthliness, worldliness is what it represents. See, there's two main tactics of this spirit, two main. And, and, and these are real simple tactics. And you think, wow, I've seen this, I've seen that. And some of you, when we go through these, you might be like, wow, I remember seeing somebody like that, or I know somebody like that. And if it's you this morning, go, oh me, help me, Lord. <laughs> because when I, when I go through this, I'm like, Oh, Lord, help me. Because, I mean, there's times I'm like this myself. But one of the main tactics, one of the main tactics of this spirit, this demonic spirit, is for someone to have a real or imagined wrong done to a believer by a fellow believer. Hmm, think about that for a second. 
what, what, what do you mean by that? That basically means that um, I say or I do something that just really flies off the wall and offends Gene. And instead of me going and reconciling it and making it right and brotherly love and Christian love, I just let it sit and fester. See, that's a spirit. That's a demonic spirit. Why? Because the godly spirit does what? Wants to unify us. Wants to bring us together. Why? Because that's what God does. That's the spirit of God. But see, the spirit of hell wants to divide. The spirit of hell wants to not just divide, but wants to conquer. Because why? Because this spirit is a contentious spirit. What happens when this happens? Now, remember what I said. It says it's a real or imagined. Because sometimes we imagine things of people that aren't there. I remember there was a pastor I used to I used to know, and I thought that he thought something about me, which he did not think about me at all. You ever been there? And so what would I do? I'd avoid it. Why did I avoid it? Because I had an imagined idea in my head of what they thought of me, but it wasn't true at all. Matter of fact, this guy had admired me. This guy loved me to pieces. I didn't know this, but I had allowed the enemy to place a thought, an imagined thought in my head of what this person thought of me that was not true. That's an imagined thought. That's an imagined idea. But sometimes it's also real. Sometimes it's real. Sometimes we do offend one another. Sometimes we do upset one another. Sometimes we do make each other mad. And it's real. The bottom line isn't whether or not we offend. The bottom line is not whether or not it's real or imagined. The bottom line is, are we making it right? Are we allowing it to lead to anger and then the root of bitterness and wrath and hatred and eventually get us out of sorts in such a way that we end up leaving a church or leaving a group, a Bible study group, or leaving a fellowship or something like that? Or do we get it right with God and get it right with the individual? Either we've wronged or that other individual has wronged. See, this spirit wants to do this. Why? Because how many people know, have heard people make this comment, I won't go back to church because I got hurt too bad. How many of you heard the comment, I'm not going back to church because of all those hypocrites? Well, I'm sorry, but you know what? The church is a place of healing like a hospital. And I tell you what, if you are a hypocrite, this is the best place for you. I'll stand in line on that. Because none of us are perfect. But this spirit tries to invade people's minds and to put these thoughts in them. Why? To keep them out of fellowship. To keep them out of the will of God. Hebrews 12, 15 and 16 says this. So, so to see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. Wow, what's that mean? First thing we got to do, Paul, the writer of Hebrews says, you need to focus on grace before you focus on anything. Focus on grace. That not that not that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble. What does that mean? A bitterness, a bitter person is going to cause trouble. Someone's mad is going to cause trouble. And we have to, through grace and love, somehow or another, stop the trouble. And by it, many be defiled. What's he saying? Saying that if we don't stop the trouble before it happens, if we don't make things right before it gets out of hand, it's going to create trouble. And not only will it create trouble, but it will defile people. Why? Because there are somebody in the congregation or somebody in our life or somebody maybe in our family that is watching our life and how we respond to situations. And if we don't respond in grace and we allow this trouble or this thing to defile us, they'll be looking at you and saying, you are a hypocrite. You're wrong. Why, why, why are you out of source for? Well, I thought you were about love. I thought you were about grace. I thought you were about mercy. I thought you were about this. Because they're looking at our lives. Our lives are always that witness. But see, we have, we have to take charge of that. What's the, one of the first tactics? To have that real or that imagined wrong done to a believer by a fellow believer. The second, second tactic this spirit loves to use is to create a hard, calloused heart. You know, to have a hard, calloused heart doesn't mean you're not sitting in church. I know some people that sit in church, and I'm not saying anybody in here, but I'm just saying I know people that sit in church Sunday after Sunday who has a very hard calloused heart. What do you mean by that? Because if the Holy Spirit showed up and hit them on the side of the head, they'd argue. That's how I know, because they refuse to change. 
They refuse to, to submit to God's word and submit to what God's wanting to do in their life. And so they have this calloused heart. They lack fruit in their life. I mean, think about a calloused heart for a second. A calloused heart is one of those, you know, those spirits that walk around and, you know, you give somebody a million dollars and they'll complain you gave it in the right hand instead of the left hand. Just give me the million dollars. I don't care what hand it's in. <laughs> but the spirit will do that. It's a calloused heart. The Bible talks about fallow ground. It's ground that is used to be tilled. It used to be ready for seeds to be fruitful, but because of neglect, it has become hard and good for you. See, the Lord warned Israel when they were about to invade the enemy. He said it to them this way in Jeremiah. For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground and do not sow among thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and remove the foreskins of your heart, men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, or else my wrath will go forth like fire and burn with none to quench it because of the evil of your deeds. Wow. What's he saying? He's saying break up your heart. You've got to have a soft heart, a pliable heart. You've got to allow God to apply that heart. Jesus describes five spiritual characteristics of a hard heart in Mark 8, 17, and these are really good. It says this, And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not see or understand? Do you not have, do you have a hardened heart? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not hear? What are these of a hard heart. Well, I, I give them to you. And if you're wondering what this word "prush" means, I didn't know this until yesterday. I was like, "Yes, I got an acronym that actually is a word." Um, but "prush" actually in Indonesia, European language, uh, the languages over in that area of the world, actually means to burn like an ember. Well, you can't burn like an ember if you can't perceive the things of God. You can't burn like an ember if you don't remember what God's done in your life. You can't burn like an ember if you don't understand the deep spiritual things that God is trying to show you. You can't burn like an ember if you can't see past the natural into the spiritual and dream with what the dreams that God has. You can't burn like an ember for God if you can't hear the voice of the Lord and the Holy Spirit conviction in your life. Prush is an Indonesian word, but wow, what an acronym to remember. These are the characters if you, we don't have these things in our heart, if we're not able to do these things in our life, when it comes to listening to the things of God, we have to ask ourselves, do I have a heart? Do I have a heart of stone? Is my heart cold? Is my heart calloused? Because I tell you this morning, God doesn't want you to have a hard heart. He doesn't want you to have a, a, a heart that is calloused. Why? Because it's going to miss out. It's going to paralyze you in the spiritual realm to the point that you're not going to be able to see, understand, perceive, hear, or even begin to have a new idea of what God is trying to do in your life. He will do everything He can to try to create a hard heart. Why? To distract us from the promises of God. This is a tactic of the Gergeshite spirit because He's trying to pull us down. I mentioned earlier the Garneans saying Garneans, what does Garneans have to do with anything? Well, it has to do with a lot because the word Gergeshite in the New Testament is actually Garnean. And, 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 and we find that in, in, in the New Testament, Jesus deals with this Gergeshite spirit in, in an area called the Garnean region. And the Garnean is actually the same name as Gergeshite in the, in the New Testament. But what are two main things or, that we find that goes on in this Garnean area? Well, one thing that we find that goes on in Matthew 8 is that when Jesus crosses us over to the sea and he goes into the area of the Garneans, the first thing he encounters, he begins to deal with is a demonic spirit. This demonic spirit, and many of you all probably remember the story of Legion. He's got all these spirits inside of him. He's in a cave. He's cutting himself up. He's, he's ever deadly. He's running around naked because the scripture says that he was had to be clothed and put in his right mind. He obviously had some mental issues and different things going on. Who knows? But we know that this guy was under the influence of a demonic spirit that was really, really strong. 
And one of the first things Jesus does is he goes and he deals with the Spirit. And the Spirit cries out. You know, it's interesting because the Bible says, and I hear people all the time say this, well, I believe in God. Well, I'm glad you do. So does the demons in hell. And they're going straight to hell. So does the devil. He believes in God too. Why do you think he's fighting? It takes more than just a belief. It takes a lifestyle. It takes obedience. It takes stepping out in faith. It takes doing those things that God wants you to do. See, this demon spirit named Legion, as soon as Jesus walks in, what ends up happening? He goes, hey, son of God. And he recognizes the fact that Jesus is the son of God. And Jesus begins to turn around and begins to deal with the spirit. What ends up happening is there's a herd of pigs over here. And he says, and this is an interesting thing. Is the spirit asks Jesus permission to go into the pigs and ground instead of going to hell or just being released. Matter right, of fact, they cry out and they say, don't torment well, the herdsmen get mad, needless to say, and they go on. In Luke chapter 8, though, it talks about the fact that when this man gets healed from the, these demons and he's out of the cave and he's back in society again, in Luke 8, it talks about the fact that the people were frightened. And why were they frightened? They were frightened because they saw a man that was out of control. They saw a man that had so much issues, so many problems inside of him, so many things that were going on that nobody could control him. Matter of fact, the scripture says they tried to chain him down numerous times and could not chain him down. Why were the people frightened after he gets his Think about that. Because the Bible says in Luke 8 that Jesus, that he, they found him sitting at Jesus' feet and in his right mind. Yet right after that, it says, and they became frightened. These people, and, and you know, sometimes when you, you have to be careful in the Greek because when you go into Greek, sometimes that word frightened actually really means to be afraid and sometimes it means to be awestruck. Well, they weren't awestruck. They were frightened. They were scared. Why were they scared? I personally believe they were scared because they realized that Jesus had control of all things and they were dealing with some things in their own life that they knew they needed to get cleaned up and get right and they refused to get it right. And so they became frightened lest Jesus point something out in their own life as well. But we know Jesus isn't like that. We know Jesus is not wanting us to go around and start pointing things out without having grace and love. So we find that the legion of demons is here. But we also find out what happens to the prodigal son. The prodigal son, what's he do? He goes because of worldliness, because his focus was visual, because his focus was on the things, his temporal things around him. He goes to his dad and he says, Dad, give me my inheritance. Give me what I need right now because I want to go live my own wild life. I want to go do my own thing. His father gives him his inheritance. The Bible says he goes out and he blows all his money. Where does he end up? He ends up with the pigs. Isn't that something how you have a legion of demons that are in a bunch of pigs and you have a prodigal son that's living among the pigs? See, a Gergeshite spirit does us no good to follow, does us no good to get caught up in because if we keep looking at visual things, if we're caught up in worldly things, if we're caught up in anything except for the hope and the faith that we need to have in the Lord Jesus Christ, we will find ourselves so caught up in this worldly spirit called the Gergeshite spirit, it will pull us down and cause us again to live with the pigs. Why, are, why do people, you know, the, the scriptures talk about the fact that, you know, a person who, who returns to their sins is like a dog that returns to its mom. Jesus talked about when he rebuked the demons out of somebody, he said, now go, don't do this anymore because it'll come back seven times worse than what you had it before. What, what am I saying in all that? I'm saying that this Gergeshite spirit understands those principles. This Gergeshite spirit knows that if it can cause you to get distracted, if it can cause you to lose focus of the things of God, it's got you. God forbid that we not focus on Jesus. See, the goal of the Gergeshite spirit, the ultimate goal, it calls you to create what they call apostasy. What is apostasy? Well, apostasy, very simple put, is this. I was serving God yesterday, and I made a conscious decision. I'm not serving Him anymore. I know He's real. I know the Bible's real. But you know what? I disagree with Him, and I'm walking away. Some people call that backsliding. You call it one. The scriptures call it apostasy. 
It's a literal walking away from the things of God. And see, this Gergeshite spirit wants to cause us to do this. It wants to cause us to get so ham enamorated with the things of the world that we lose sight. It wants to bring us back to our past sins, our past habits, our past problems. It wants us to cause us to focus on those things that are not important around us. Signs of people who struggle with this, just real quick, I'm going to go through this. Signs of people who struggle with this spirit. Like I said, if it's, because some of these are like, oh, me. I'm not going to say raise a hand and say, oh, me. But I want you to think about this as I go through these. Signs of people who struggle with this. They emphasize analyzation and organization of outward temporal evidence instead of placing faith in the eternal truth of Scripture. Look at that for a second. They visualize with contempt the things that cannot be discerned with the natural mind. In other words, if, if I can't understand it here, then I don't want no part. It, it, it's like they're contentious with it. God can show up and heal somebody and there'll be evidence that physical evidence that they were healed and they were hurt. That's a very good spirit. That's someone caught up in the vision. They're sensual. They centralize and they pursue temporal things for happiness and completeness with an ever-increasing desire for more but never being satisfied. Don't let that sound like that. Always pursue more. Need more money, more stuff, more this, more, 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 more. We're caught up in a central temple thing. If I can just get a bigger house, a bigger car, if I can have a bigger checkbook, if I can have this bigger, 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 I'll be happier, 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 happier. Well, I'm sorry, it ain't going to make you happier. It's going to make you more miserable. Because when you think about it, how many people do we know that were millionaires in Hollywood, played football, played basketball, whatever, around this nation that were multi-millionaires and committed suicide? Why? Because they said they were depressed Temporal things don't matter. Central things don't matter. They don't complete us. Gergeshite spirit is short-sighted because they're focused on what is tangible or can be seen and is quick to relinquish the idea of a higher long-term vision that demands faith, considering what God wants regardless of the temporal evidence. Sometimes God asks us to step out. You know, I love what the scripture says that, that Abraham had hope against hope. What did, what did that mean? That means that Abraham had an expectancy against his expectancy. So that when his first expectancy runs out, he's going to keep on expecting it. Why? Because he knows the promises of God are true. He had hope against hope. He had expectancy against expectancy. He stood in the promises of God because he knew they were true. They're unstable, they're, they're unstable belief system. They have an unstable belief system in their, char in their character. These are, these are evidence when storms of life come because they are quick to quit, complain, and compromise in order to achieve what they want. <laughs> you know people like that? Don't raise their hand. But think about that. They have this unstable belief system. They're quickly swayed by the crowd. You know, you can do... You may buy them, they're so quickly swayed by the crowd. It's like one minute they're saying this, and then you get them over here in this other group, and they're saying something different. And then you get them over here in this other group, and they're saying something different. What is that person? That person is unstable. I encourage you to stay away from such people. They, they'll, they'll, they'll shipwreck you every time. So how do we address this? Well, the first thing we got to do is we got to crucify our flesh. It's the first thing we got to do. All through the scriptures. As a matter of fact, Paul, Paul uses the book of Romans, an entire book, that gives an illustration of how to crucify our flesh. What does it mean to crucify our flesh and the passions and desires and behaviors? Well, I'm going to run these, run these through. He said, then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. I have been crucified, Paul says, with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul says again in Galatians, and those who are Christ, listen to what he says, those who are Christ. In other words, if you are a child of God, if you are a child of God, this is what Paul says, you have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. I love what Isaiah says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, thank God for that. 
nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. The last thing, and secondly, we got to ask ourselves in any decision in life, whether it's our attitude, our behavior, whatever we're doing in life, we have to ask ourselves, what kind of godly wisdom or logic am I trying to follow here? What is I'm trying to do? And I'm not going to reread all of James chapter 3. But James chapter 3, 13 through 18 is a powerful, powerful passage of scripture that I use in almost every single decision that I try to make. Because if I make a decision that's not based on the word of God, I know right off that it's Roger's decision to not God. But if I can go to the word of God and find principle in scripture on making a decision, I know that this decision is most likely, not all the time, James chapter 3, he gives you those things. And so we have to ask ourselves these questions. First question we have to ask ourselves, is my decision is earthly, sensual, and demonic? Because James says in chapter 3 that any decision that we don't make or any decision that we make that don't have the qualities that I'm about ready to show you here in a minute, if we don't have these qualities in our decision, it's demonic. That's pretty strong. So what we have to do, we, we, we have to discern, we have to ask ourselves the, que the following questions. Do I harbor bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in my heart? Am I arrogant or proud? Am I creating disorder or confusion? Because if you're creating any of these, your decision is not a God. There's unity in a godly decision. That doesn't mean all agree. That doesn't mean that all come into agreement. But what it does is it unifies. The second question we have to ask ourselves is this. Do I have the fruit of wisdom in my decision? And what does that fruit of the wisdom look like? What well, godly wisdom, first of all, it's pure. There's not a selfish motive behind it. It's pure. It's peaceable. It's gentle. It's yielding. It's merciful. It's got good fruit in it. It's impartial. It's genuine. And it's righteous. This is a godly decision. The question you have to ask what type of life are we living? A sensual or a spiritual life? What kind of decisions am I making? How am I in my relationships? What am I doing? Am I giving way to emotion? Am I having these imaginary thoughts that people are thinking or saying about me that they're really not sitting and thinking about me? Am I caught up in these worldly ideas and these worldly things of logic and visual ideas and things? Or am I caught up in the things of God? You're saying, man, I see myself all over this this morning. I'm glad you do because I tell you what, when I look when I look at this right here and I see my own life, I say, wow, God help me. Because it's so easy to be caught up in visual evidence. It's so easy to get caught up in the visual that we miss the spiritual because we're sensual people. We like to listen to our five senses. Some of us right now are listening to the sense of listen to our senses. We can't do that. We've got to listen to the Spirit of God. Deuteronomy 7, 1, and this is where I'm in. God told Israel, He reminded Israel. He says, when you go after these nations, you go after these spirits, I want you to realize these things are greater and mightier than you. You're saying, well, preacher, boy, that was really encouraging. You told me I got these issues in my life, and now you're saying it's bigger than me. And you're right, it's bigger than me bigger than me. But listen to what Deuteronomy 7.22 says. And the Lord your God will drive out these nations before you little by little. You will be unable to destroy them at once. Wow, that means it's going to take time. Oh, I don't like time. I want things right now. That's the problem with being sensual is we want deliverance now instead of working through the process. We've got to work the process. But we also must remember the words of John as he boldly states in 1 John 4, 4 through 6, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in this world. What am I saying? The Jesus in you, you come up against something sensual, you get something, you come up against something that's trying to rob your faith and create fear, that's trying to get you to go into these lusts and these habits and these problems and return you from, to the vomit that you used to live in. You rise up inside and you say, Jesus inside of me is greater than that. I can't do it in myself, but because of him, I will conquer. 
I will conquer. You are victorious this morning. You are victorious. When I was, when my kids were about 10 years old, I was with a group of people. And I was with a group of people. They were going to be talking about these other individuals. It's probably not bad things. It's probably not so bad things. They were talking about whether or not we could trust the word of these other individuals. We were trying to get a job. And in our discussion, I didn't know my son was over here. This guy had been kind of shady, shady and there was some issues and stuff, you know. And, and uh, my son just out of nowhere just comes up. He goes, well, he goes, my dad's a man of his word. I kind of looked over at him. I was like, first in the first instance, I was like, shut up, right? You know, nothing. But the next word out of his mouth is what got He said, my dad's a man of his word. Sometimes it just takes time to see it. And I sat there and I thought to myself, how many times, because we're caught up in the here and now, instead of seeing the spiritual on down the road where God may be leading us, or where he's trying to take us, that we hear God's word, we know God's word, but we want to hear it now, instead of waiting the process and saying, okay, I'm not to And see, it's in that process of time that we begin to doubt. It's in that process of time that we begin to question God. It's in that process of time we begin to say, God, are you really real? Are you really true? If not, why aren't you showing me? The thing is, is he's already true. He's already showed up. His word is always true. And sometimes the process of what he's trying to do in us is more important than giving us what we need. That's the promise. God has many promises in his word for every single one of us. I want to encourage you this morning. As you trust God for whatever need you have in your life, don't allow the sensuality of this world to rob you of the hope and the faith that you have in Jesus Christ. Walk the process. Allow God to speak to you, move you, change you, mold you. Don't allow yourself to get hard and cast. Allow yourself to be teachable. Father, I thank you today for your word. I thank you for your promises. I thank you because you are so, so true. But Father, it's so easy to get caught up in the world. It's so easy to get caught up in being sensual, listening to our senses and our logic, being visual, trying to analyze and overanalyze and try to organize, overorganize. Lord, eventually we can organize and analyze and visualize and logicalize and everything else you write out. us to cling to hope. Help us to cling, God, to those promises in your word. Help us to make godly decisions based upon your word of being pure and, and, and being righteous and being holy. And, and God, those, those qualities, God, that you've taught us. God, continue to unify us and bring us together as one. Continue to love us the way that we need to be loved. God, teach us to love you the way you want it to be. Father, I thank you today because I know that if anybody is dealing with this in their life, there is victory. And that's through your son. So, Father, we open the altars up this morning for anybody who has a need. 